love the Catholic Church. It's just the best place to be. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line. In North America, call toll-free 1-800-585-9396. That's 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Welcome to Open Line Wednesday on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. We're so glad you took some time out of your day to join us here on Open Line Wednesday. Normally, Father Mitch Pacwa would be in the house answering your questions. Father Mitch is traveling this week, so he won't be with us, but we have a very very capable and able replacement, as we'll be joined in just a moment by the President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Archbishop of the Diocese, the Archdiocese of Louisville, uh, the Most Reverend Joseph E. Kurtz, and he will join us in just a moment. He will answer your questions here on Open Line Wednesday. The number to talk to Archbishop Kurtz, 1-800-585-9396. That's toll-free anywhere in North America. 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we've got a number for you. It's 1-205-271-2985. And we will put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. Or you can send us an email, openline at EWTN. Com. I'm Jack Williams. Elena Rodriguez produces the program, and your call screener is Mr. Matt Kubinski. As I mentioned, Pope Benedict XVI appointed the Most Reverend Joseph Kurtz as the fourth Archbishop and ninth Bishop of the Archdiocese of Louisville on June 12, 2007. He was installed as Archbishop of Louisville on August 15, 2007. Before coming to Louisville, Archbishop Kurtz served as Bishop of the Knoxville Diocese from 1999 to 2007. He's a native of the great state of Pennsylvania, and you would be most familiar with him probably as the president currently of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. So when he, we here on EWTN cover those plenary meetings or ask for statements from that body, we usually hear those from Archbishop Kurtz. And Your Excellency, it is a treat to have you here on Open Line Wednesday. Welcome. Jack, thank you. It's it's a pleasure to be with you, and uh, I'm not sure I'm a fitting replacement for Father Mitch, but I'm honored to do that. Well, Father Mitch, we we what we always tell our callers to and our listeners to fasten their seatbelts when Father Mitch uh, walks into <laughs> yeah, the exactly. studio and takes his hat off. But, it, because, but it's a joy to be with you. Thank you. Well, we're so glad to have you here, and I thought a good place for us to start, Archbishop, is most of our viewers and listeners will be familiar with seeing you as they have your predecessors over the years. Uh, sitting at the head table at these plenary meetings of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And I thought maybe you could talk first about the group itself uh, and then maybe what went on or some of the tenor of this most recent plenary meeting. The the whole notion of these regional bishops' conferences, really in the history of the Church, a fairly new idea, isn't it? Well, relatively new, you're right. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Jack. Uh, uh, an Episcopal conference became especially active after the Second Vatican Council. There, there were uh, seeds of it. Uh, there was a National Welfare Council, and, so, and there were uh, plenary councils. Do you remember uh, the plenary councils of Baltimore? that go back into the 1800s uh, were, were really the, the bringing together of all the bishops at that time. So there were, there, I think there has always been a gathering of bishops, but the current structure uh, really, with some variations, goes back to uh, the, uh, the late 1960s. Um, and uh, you're right, we have about 400 bishops, uh, both those who are retired, those who are uh, diocesan bishops and uh, auxiliaries uh, in the United States. And, uh, of course, not all, especially not all the retired bishops, are able to come to the meetings. But we have about 300 bishops who come, and uh, of that, uh, between 40 and 50 would be retired. So there'd be about 250 voting members. And that's what we had this, this week, this past week, uh, at our plenary meeting in Baltimore. Uh, I can mention some of the, the topics, if you'd like. I would like to get to those, but one one more question before we get to that. I would sure. assume that you would uh, agree with me that, that um, the faithful in a region, in this particular case the United States of America, benefit greatly not only hearing from their own shepherd, but hearing one voice from the entire group of shepherds in their well, country. 
That's a good point. There's, in fact, I'm, I'm glad you said that. Uh, there is a document that uh, St. John Paul II put out in the late 1990s co- called Apostolos Suos, in which he talked about Episcopal conferences. And when he, and by the way, there's about 115 Episcopal conferences spread throughout the world. So uh, we are one of about 115, and last year when the extraordinary synod occurred on the family, uh, Pope Francis called together all 115 and then added a few of, of his, own, his own appointments, especially those who serve in Rome. There, there's really three major responsibilities that an Episcopal conference has, and when I mention them, you won't be surprised. Uh, the first is we're called together to... Uh, help the local bishop, in other words, to provide resources, to provide uh, ways in which the local bishop, working with his priests and deacons and and lay faithful, uh, bring Christ's presence to bear on pastoral issues. And so a lot of the work we do at a conference uh, will be on that. In a moment, I'll I'll say something about the uh, pastoral, the formal statement that we, we made uh, uh, about the dangers of pornography create in me a clean heart. Well, that's primarily going to be for use on the local level. People in their parishes will begin to see either that document or maybe some small brochures that summarize it. So that's the first thing. The second is, as you just mentioned, we bring a common voice, uh, a common moral voice on vital issues of our day on a national level. Often, in our advocacy uh, with uh, legislative issues, but but there are sometimes other such situations. We we may have a uh, a brief that goes to the Supreme Court, for instance. What we're we'll be doing in anticipating uh, the HHS mandate and the Little Sisters of the Poor and and the number of groups who rightly are uh, are seeking relief from uh, a burdensome docu- a burdensome uh, regulation. And then the third level that not too many people think about is we are called to fraternally support other Episcopal conferences throughout the world, always in union with our Holy Father. So it was no accident that uh, in January of this past year, I went to Haiti, where there were great needs to work with the Episcopal conference. In June, I went to Ukraine, and uh, actually the uh, a year before, in February, I went to the Philippines. They were all sites of either uh, a terrible uh, disaster that has occurred or turmoil in which uh, we seek to, to be of help to the bishops of, of the, that local country. So that gives you kind of an overview, if you would, of the structure of the Bishops' Conference. There is certainly no shortage of challenges facing Uh the Catholic faithful in our society today. I don't know how you would prioritize what you fit into this most recent meeting, but what did you talk about and talk about some of the things that came out of it? Well, let me begin by the one that I just mentioned, because we've been working on it for a year and a half. Uh, Talk about a a primary way in in which we can help the family and the individual and our spirituality is to address in a frank and honest way the dangers of pornography. And you know, uh, Jack, uh, the statistics are showing that uh, not only is uh, pornography so prevalent and so damaging to the individual, but it cuts at the very core of family. People turn in on themselves instead of reaching out to family members and beyond. So the document, it's called a formal statement, is uh, entitled Create in Me a Clean Heart. And it will uh, not only lay the groundwork on what some of the reality is, but also the Church's teachings, beginning with a beautiful presentation of, of, uh, of what would be a holy and healthy way of looking at sexuality, God's plan uh, for human sexuality. And then dealing with very concrete ways in which uh, we can uh, move people toward a more wholesome entertainment. Uh, Good for me talking about EWTN, because that's one of the the very vehicles that we want to promote. so that that was that was one of the areas uh, that that we talked about. Uh, I can mention some others. Did you want? uh, Go right ahead. Yeah. Uh, Another one that that got a lot of headlines is with with the election coming up a a year from now, the presidential election. Uh, Cardinal DiNardo did us a great service in chairing uh, a committee that uh, 
what I would say did some minor revisions of uh, of the document that was approved by the bishops, uh, oh, I'd say in 2008, and put a new introductory note. Of course, since that time, we've had uh, the, the teachings of uh, Pope Benedict XVI in his latter days as, as our Holy Father, and then the whole pontificate of Pope Francis. And of course, we've had some new challenging issues uh, in our own day. So that's a document that has been approved. Uh, I think it'll be uh, a guide for the local bishops as they seek to, uh, to help form well-formed consciences am- among Catholics and people of goodwill, and of course, uh, in, a, in a way that promotes uh, good and generous involvement of citizens, of, of our faithful as good citizens. We're just getting started on an open line Wednesday. Sitting in today for Father Mitch Paqua is Archbishop Joseph Kurtz of the Archdiocese of Louisville, Kentucky. If you've got a question for the Archbishop, 1-800-585-9396. Open line Wednesday rolls on. A moment with Mother. You're not supposed to put a shortwave network on a mountain. Matt took me up, he said, we got some land that we could buy about 200 acres, but it's in the wrong place. So we go up there, I get out of the car, I saw St. Michael just standing there. And I said, we'll buy it. (laughs) He said, mother, it's the wrong place. I said, we'll buy it. But you don't put shortwave networks on the mountain. I said, do you see St. Michael there? He said, no, we'll buy it. (laughs) He said, okay. The first day we were on the air, we got a, a, a letter from Japan uh, two weeks later saying, I got your signal. We weren't even aiming in that direction. <laughs> and he said, I like your network for Buddhist prayer. I said, Buddhist prayer? <laughs> it was the rosary here. I said, let him say the rosary, Lord, he won't know. Podcasts of Open Line are available within 24 hours of live broadcast. Go to EWTN.com and click on Multimedia. Hello, this is Archbishop Joseph Kurtz of the Archdiocese of Louisville, and you're listening to the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call one 800 585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. EWTN radio programming is heard on great stations around the United States like 89.7 FM in Bath, Maine, 107.9 FM in Owensboro, Kentucky, and 97.3 FM in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Archbishop Joseph Kurtz sitting in today for Father Mitch Paqua. Archbishop, are you ready to take some phone calls? I sure am, Jack. I sure am. Our leadoff hitter today is Alma in the great state of Texas, listening on Guadalupe Radio, FM 89.7. Alma, what's your question today for the Archbishop? Alma, are you there? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Archbishop, thank you for taking my call. I was just calling um, with a question. Um, I know that um, in, in my journey of faith, I've uh, come to a point where I'm ready to do more than, you know, attend my Sunday Mass and say my prayers at home and help family. And I've really been attracted to the, the pro-life uh, movement uh, since about a year ago and trying to just protect, you know, the unborn and, and those that are um, uh, helpless, I guess. Uh, with so much of that going on in the community, I wanted to see how I could get started with that, and um, going through that journey, as it turns out, I guess the Lord was preparing me, because my daughter, my teenage daughter, is now uh, pregnant with a little girl, and so I want to do more than just help her along with her child. I also want to reach out, you know, to other uh, young ladies that are faced with that decision or that have that situation. And I was just wondering, how, how do we get started when we feel uh, the passion to do something more? Well, well, great question. Uh, Jack, may I just go right ahead and, and give an initial answer? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Alma, thank you so much for, for that question. And first of all, 
thank you for feeling in your heart your desire to, to reach out to your own daughter uh, and also to uh, to say, well, uh, there must be other daughters out there who 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 need my help. Uh, so I, I just commend you for it. Uh, there's a number of things I'm going to mention. As always, uh, having been a pastor myself, I always like to say uh, the first thing to do is go look at what may be happening within your parish or within your own diocese. Uh, uh, often there are things going on. When I was a pastor, we had a uh, a beautiful monthly program that we have here in Louisville called Helpers of God's Precious Infants. And that's a monthly prayer opportunity, both within a church and, and also a prayer, prayerful presence at an abortion clinic. Um, another program that is uh, something that the bishops are, are promoting very strongly is Project Rachel. And it's reaching out to, to people very much in need that is very pro-life. And I suspect that in your area, there are going to be uh, some form of pregnancy resource centers. We have here in Louisville a beautiful program called The Little Way, named after uh, St. Teresa of the Little, the Little Flower, St. Teresa of Lisieux. And in those programs, there's room for many people. There's, there's, there's uh, people who are, who are mentors, who walk sometimes with a, a woman who is pregnant and needs help and needs support with her family. There's people who do volunteer works. There's some people who, who answer phones and some people who just drive cars, etc. So there's many, many ways that you could be involved. But I think if I were to say what's one thing to do, I'd begin by looking at your own parish in your own parish bulletin or on your diocesan website. And I'll bet there will be a a phone number to call. Uh, If you need further help, you can always go to uh, the USCCB website. Uh, The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops have uh, pro-life activities uh, listed, and uh, there would be a, a way for you also to make to make that contact. Jack, that, can you think of anything else that I, I'd want to say? I Alma think gave a great question. I think you gave a great answer. Is that helpful to you, Alma? Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank well, you. Well, thanks for your goodness, Alma, and, and I'll pray for you and, and your daughter and your child, the child on the way, and also uh, for for your blessed family. Thank you so much, and have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Next up for us is Fred in Denver, Colorado, listening on Denver Catholic Radio, AM 1060. Denver, you're on with Archbishop Kurtz. Fred, go right ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Archbishop. Hi, Fred. Hello. Fred, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you now. Archbishop? Yes. Go, go ahead. Right. Go ahead with your question, oh, okay. Fred. Okay. I, okay. My question is, Besides the Bibles of the Catholic Church and the span between the Catholic Church and King James, were there other authors, and and was King James inspired, or what source did he use to come up with his translation? And just to let you know, I've had my I've got the confraternity version. Can you uh, comment on that? Were there other authors and other Bibles out there, Archbishop? Sure. Well, let me just mention first of all. Uh... Uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question, and you're, uh, the most basic thing is you're reading the Bible. And the Bible is the Word of God. Now, you know that as Catholics, we know the Word of God is Jesus. And one way in which we come to know Him, uh, the two main ways of revelation, one is the Bible, and one is, is sacred tradition. And so uh, the Bible and church teachings all work hand in hand in God revealing himself to us in this day. What you referred to as authors are really translators. So remember that the, the Bible wasn't written in English, and so uh, much of the Bible was, it was either in Aramaic or Hebrew or uh, the Septuagint that comes from uh, 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 the Alexandria area from from Egypt was written in Greek, and so those those needed to be uh, translated. Now, the, the, one of the most recent translations that we used as Catholics when I was growing up was called the Revised Standard Version, and that was based on 
the Latin Vulgate. That was a translation that St. Jerome gave all the way back in the 4th century. So that goes pretty far back. Uh, the King James Version uh, is, is a very poetic version. It doesn't include all of the canons, meaning all of the all of the books of the Bible that we as Catholics hold as dear to us. So it's not the complete Bible for us, but it would be uh, a, a very beautiful translation that is used in in many many Protestant churches. And actually, uh, it, it was written around the time of Shakespeare. And some even say that Shakespeare had a hand in some of the translations. But remember, Fred, we're not talking about. Uh, these the authors the authors remain the same it's the the main author the author is really the inspiration of the holy spirit so god is the author working through for instance in the gospels through saint matthew uh saint mark saint luke and saint john but god is the author but the the, the various versions in english are actually translations that have come to us over the centuries i tend to use the New American Bible, and when you go to church and you hear uh, the, gospel, the gospel proclaimed or the readings of sacred scripture, that's coming from the New American Bible, from our lectionary. So I don't know if that answered your question. You said you have, uh, your version is, is, is confraternity. I wonder yeah. if, that's the, if that's the revised standard version. Does it, has, does, does it have RSV somewhere near it? I'm not. I'm pretty sure it does. Uh, I got it back in the 1960s. In my yeah, that would religion. be it. That that was called the Revised Standard Version. Now, the New American Bible was was translated later. And what was happening, Fred? Just so you'd know, uh, that Bible came from Scripture scholars going as far back as they could to the original language. So instead of uh, instead of uh, translating. Uh, uh, from the Latin, which was in, in turn translated from the Greek or Aramaic, uh, the New American Bible would go right back to the original language. And that's the reason for it. You won't see much difference in it, but uh, in terms of uh, the use of the ch choice of words sometimes. Thanks so much, Fred, for that full call. And Archbishop, I'm sure that you would agree with this, but I hear many scripture scholars, especially Catholic scripture scholars, who say when comparing translations of Catholic Bibles, the most important thing is to find one that you'll actually read. Well, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, and I have found, uh, believe it or not, I, I have found that sometimes people will read something if it's smaller. So I actually have at my, at my, uh, in my little chapel, uh, a small version that is only the Gospels, and you'd be surprised how how often I pick up the Gospels and I'll I'll begin to read uh, Saint Mark from beginning to end. And uh, uh, you're absolutely right. It is important though that that people, um, if they buy one, that, that that they buy a Bible that is uh, has an imprimatur on it that is an approved Catholic version, because other some other Bibles do not have uh, all of the text that we would believe in. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. That's the number Jackie used in Omaha, Nebraska. She's listening on Spirit Catholic Radio, FM 102.7. Jackie, you're on with Archbishop Kurtz. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my call. My, Hi, my question, Archbishop, is in regard to an annulment. My daughter uh -huh. has been married to a beautiful Methodist uh, Christian man for over 10 years, and they were married in the Methodist Church due to their, the process that uh, the priest was using to, to prepare them for a Catholic marriage. Well, the annulment did not go through. They worked on it for two years. They did everything they had to do, but the ex-wife refused to sign the paper that she was required to sign. And I'm the mother of the bride, and I, I'm concerned about them. They're not youngsters anymore, and I'm concerned about them because they are not pursuing this. And I want to know what can I do as a mother in another state. Yeah, you know, Jackie, well, I'm sure the Archbishop has plenty to say about this. We're going to take a quick break here in just a minute, and we'll let Archbishop come back on the other side and give you a full and complete answer to that question, which is a good one that I know a lot of people wrestle with this very topic uh, in our listening audience. If you've got a question for Archbishop Joseph Kurtz, the number's 1-800-585-9396. That's toll-free anywhere in North America, one 800 Five eight five nine three nine six, or you can send us an email, openline at EWTN.com. Open Line Wednesday, Archbishop Joseph Kurtz sitting in for Father Mitch Pacwa.
I was actually raised in the Catholic Church. I, I um, went to grade school uh, through sixth grade, and pretty much about the time I went to high school, um, I stopped attending church and really didn't think much more about it for a number of years. The return to church, the Catholic Church, was somewhat of an evolution. I thought I knew what the Catholic Church believed and taught, but uh, learned very quickly from somebody who knew far more about the Bible than I ever hoped to know. Uh, I learned that the Catholic Church, what it truly taught, and that that's where I needed to be. I'm a recovered alcoholic and drug addict. Without God in my life, I'd probably be dead. God has literally saved my life. I feel like I'm truly on the road to um, the fulfillment of, of really all of my desires, uh, which is ultimately to spend eternity in heaven, both myself and my family. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for whatever reason, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. Imagine waking up, grabbing your morning coffee, and being told that an army was surrounding your house. That happened to Elisha the prophet, <laughs> minus the coffee. A king had sent an army to surround his town and capture him, but he never lost his confidence. When his servant panicked, Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. His servant looked up and saw the hills around Elisha filled with horses and chariots of fire. Did you know that every Catholic is anointed as a prophet at baptism? And being a prophet means that sometimes people are going to attack you for sharing the truth, even if you do it lovingly. When that happens to you, remember there's an army of angels and saints cheering you on, Christians around the world walking with you, and above all, the God of the universe is on your side. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is Chris Stefanik from reallifecatholic.com on EWTN Radio. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Tonight on EWTN Live, Father Mitch, Father Mitch welcomes the president of the American Principles Project, Mr. Frank Cannon, and they'll have an interesting discussion tonight, 8 Eastern on EWTN Television. And Friday night on Life on the Rock, Father Mark and Doug welcome representatives from a group called Sports Leaders. Lou Judd and Paul Pasifiumi discuss, uh, they advise athletic coaches on ways to instill virtue in their players. That discussion, again, Friday, 8 Eastern on EWTN Television. We're talking with Jackie in Omaha, Nebraska, and her question of Archbishop Kurtz is she has a daughter who's married to a gentleman who was previously married in the Methodist Church, and she has some questions about the annulment process. Father, or uh, Archbishop Kurtz? Yeah, let me, Jackie, first of all, uh, thank you for waiting uh, from the break, and, and thank you for uh, the wonderful gift of faith and your love of your daughter and family. Uh, the first thing I have to say to you, Jackie, is as you pray and are a good example for your daughter, uh, know that the Church wants you to do everything you can to encourage uh, your, your daughter and her family to remain active in the Church while uh, she's married outside the Church and would not be in a position uh, to receive communion. There are many, many ways in which she can participate, and, and Pope Francis has been very strong, and rightly so, in this Jubilee Year of Mercy, of making sure that people know that even in, the, in her situation, she is still a member of the Church and, 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 and deserves uh, the opportunity to be active. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing I would say is, um, I know you don't want to nag your, your, your daughter if she's already tried certain things as far as an annulment and, 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 and got to a brick wall, but perhaps a couple of years have gone by from what I heard you say, and, and maybe this is the time for her to, uh, with her husband, to, to approach a priest and say, we'd like to take another look at this. And even the the barrier that occurred before, namely that, if I understood it correctly, uh, the the uh, first wife of of her current uh, civilly married husband uh, is is refusing to cooperate. Uh, maybe there there will be at this time a change of heart. Um, so I, I would I would gently uh, ask her to consider uh, doing that. Uh, there's great there's much more attention now being paid to annulments, and you know. 
an annulment uh, is not a change in church teaching. It is, it is saying, no, uh, we still believe very clearly that a valid marriage needs uh, to be permanent, to be faithful, and to open to children. But there, there, perhaps there were occasions that that first marriage that, uh, that uh, you, you were talking about, that, that her husband had entered, uh, that there was something lacking from the beginning, and perhaps now it could be looked at again. Uh, so I, I would encourage that to happen. You got to look for the right timing because I know um, no mother or father wants to nag their children. They they, they want to find the right way to encourage them. But encourage your daughter to, and her husband uh, to be active in the local parish as as much they can within their limited circumstances. And then if they are ready, without forcing them, to to have them approach a local priest. Uh, to see if perhaps this might be the time to investigate this again. Is that helpful, Jackie? It is, but I have one more question. Go right ahead. Up. Uh, they go to church. They go to the Catholic Church, and they go to Good. the Methodist Church. And when I've been up there one year for Christmas, two years, uh, we went to the Catholic Church uh, for the evening Mass, and then we went the next day for the Methodist, because he is still a Methodist. Mm-hmm. Yes, and he's. They could have I mean, had a marriage, you know, a mixed marriage, but they go both. She told him it's okay, go to communion with her. And when I'm with them, I just cringe. I have a hard time walking up to the, up to up the uh, to the altar to receive communion myself. And when they're in Omaha, I have been, uh, I am a uh, uh, Eucharistic minister of the Holy Eucharist. And I told them the first time I couldn't believe he came out of the pew with her. I couldn't stop him, and you know I, that would have been a disruption for everybody around. But I told him afterwards, if I were distributing communion today at the mass, and you came up to me, I would have had to refuse you, Chris. I really felt bad telling him that, but mm-hmm. I tried to educate them both, and I said, and "How did he respond?" Did he? So mild mannered, he doesn't respond with a big "Oh, you kidding?" or you know, no argument. He no. just absolutely smiled, and that was all. And it's, it was up to my daughter to educate him. I figured, but I did try to tell her that he can't well, go to. Well, I think, I think Alma, you did the right thing. You, um, in in many ways, uh, they're they're uh, you're, you're clear on on what the, the guidelines are in terms of our ability for someone to receive Holy Communion. Um, it's, it's, uh, you've done what I think is, is the right thing to do to, uh, to explain that uh, to him, and, and you're right. Uh, it's now uh, up to your daughter to, to seek the, the, the right way to approach things, but uh, perhaps asking them to consider beginning annulment is another indirect way of saying to them, you know, you really are not, uh, able to to fully participate right now if uh, if your marriage is not a sacramental one within the church. So um, I'll, I'll pray for them and and for you and I and I hope you, and I know you do the same because the power of prayer can move hearts and uh, you, your your understanding is correct and your pastoral patience. Uh, with your family is also correct. Thanks so much, Jackie, for that phone call. We will keep you in our prayers as well. That opens up a line for you at 1-800-585-9396. Next stop, Jacksonville, Florida. Mark listening on Queen of Peace Radio, AM 1460. Mark, what's your question today for Archbishop Kurtz? Um, Hello, uh, Archbishop Kurtz. Hi, Mark. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, I have been participating in Christian health sharing for about uh, 23 months now. And I'm Say it again, Christian sure. health sharing? Yeah, Christian health sharing, which uh, is an alternative to insurance. Um, it, you're, you don't have to pay the, the uh, fines and uh, penalties with the Affordable Care Act. And I was wondering, who might I speak to at the USCCB about uh, encouraging um, our bishops in uh, promoting Christian health sharing. Is, is that something you could help me with? 
Well, you know, I must admit, uh, you're, you're giving me something that, that uh, I need to be educated on. So one of the things that, that you can do, Mark, is, is write to me at the Archdiocese of Louisville, so I'll have some information on it. And then maybe I can look and see uh, what might be a next step, huh? Yes. Uh, Let's Christus do that. Medicus is, um, and, and is one of the, uh, it's a Catholic offshoot of one of those. Um, it's it's piggybacking off of what's called Samaritan Ministries. Okay. But uh, I'd be happy to do that. Sure, sure. Write to me and let me see. Uh, get, send me whatever information you have, and we can see your your uh, uh, your desire to to be able to enter into a health care uh, uh, insurance plan that does not support objectionable things is is certainly. Uh, laudable and and as you know one of the reasons why i mentioned earlier uh the supreme court will be looking at uh the issue of the hhs mandate is precisely uh so that uh catholic entities uh, and individuals do not uh have or are not forced to violate their consciences as they uh participate in some of the terms of what was called, what's uh, an element of the Affordable Care Act, namely the uh, Health and Human Services mandate. So uh, we're very, very interested. This is especially important as we we seek to preserve religious freedom within our nation, and it's something, as you know, that Pope Francis himself talked about on uh, more than two occasions when he came to the United States. So yes, yeah, send that to me, and I'll and I'll and I'll look it over and and and, and perhaps give you some advice. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate the phone call. Next up is Mary Ann. She's listening in the great state of Kansas. Mary Ann, what's your question today for Archbishop Kurtz? Hi, Excellency. Thanks for taking my call. Hi, um, Mary Ann. Hi. I moved from a, from a diocese that had a very rich and generous application of Samorum Pontificum to several hours away to a diocese that is that when I asked the chancery, the response was, that will never happen here. And I asked my priest, and he said, before I were ever to say the Latin Mass, I would quit the priesthood. And there are so many liturgical abuses at the modern Mass here, not in Kansas. I'm, I'm just traveling through Kansas. But the um, I called USCCB about liturgical abuses, and they said they have nothing to do with that, that each, um, each bishop runs that himself. So I called the chancery back, and they said that they let each priest supervise their own Mass, and they have nothing to do with what the Masses are like. That's all about the priest decisions. So I'm wondering, what would be a good way? It's hard to get to the bishop because the chancery is run pretty much 100% by women, and it's uh, extremely liberal, extremely progressive, anti-tradition diocese. What would be a good way to get to the bishop without having his mail opened by someone else? Or, uh, And is he obligated to comply with John Paul II and St. John Paul II and uh, uh, Pope Benedict's, um, you know, teachings about access to tradition, or or can he just disobey? Okay, well, I think, uh, Marianne, thank you. I think you have a couple of questions there that you've mentioned. Uh, one has to be, uh, has to do with with uh, access to uh, to. Uh, the the uh, the Latin Mass according to the extraordinary form, huh? And there's also, of course, opportunities for Latin Mass in the Novus Ordo. But you're talking when you when you're talking about the Latin Mass, am I right? You're you're looking at uh, the extraordinary form, meaning the the missile that, that is called the John the the uh, uh, Saint John Paul Saint John the Twenty Third missile that came uh, from 1963. And a generous application that the bishop has been asked uh, to give um, does not necessarily mean that that he uh, is required to uh, to develop a, a program, but rather to respond to requests. And I know in in the two dioceses where I've served, uh, we do have uh, the opportunity. Uh, for uh, the mass in the extraordinary form to occur, and and it is a generous application. Uh, we're fortunate because we have priests who are, were desirous and a community that was willing to support them. So, uh, 
that is occurring. Now, I think the other question you asked, I think, has to do with uh, just to what extent your local parish uh, is um, is being true to uh, the, uh, the the uh, directives, the liturgical directives of the Roman Missal, and and they are directives that I, as a bishop, I'll let me speak for myself rather than some other bishop, uh, that I, as a bishop, do have a, a serious responsibility to implement. Uh, you know that within uh, within each country, when um, the translations of the Roman Missal, which is in Latin, when those translations uh, were made, uh, there was the opportunity to have what were called indults or exceptions or adaptations to the local area. So, for example, I'll give you one adaptation that we have in the United States, whereas the Roman Missal, um, in its in its universal form, does not have the requirement of uh, of someone uh, kneeling at the Lamb of God. Uh, when we, in the United States, the bishops asked for adaptations, we put it in because we thought that that, that was a reasonable adaptation that would allow uh, a cultivation of, of really the true presence of our Lord, that there was a worry that people might become too um, cavalier in, in, in their approach. So that is not a requirement, but it is an option uh, in in uh, in parishes here in, in Louisville. That is uh, part of the requirements uh, that we have as as uh, the the way in which the mass is celebrated. Now, you, you you asked the question then about how to get to the bishop. I think it depends what you're writing about. If if you were writing about um, the desire to cel- to to participate. In a, in a Latin Mass, meaning in the Mass according to the extraordinary form, then I think you, you would write asking, where is the most available Mass? And I think you should do that always, just as we all should do, uh, always in a respectful way, of course. But I, I would write directly to the bishop on that. Have you written and not gotten a response? Yes, I have. And um, basically I get a call back from the female chancellor, and um, the... The um, the the new masses here are pretty bizarre, and, and they have quite a few abuses. And I've gone to maybe I don't know a dozen parishes or so, and it doesn't there doesn't seem to be any any kind of concern about that at all. Yeah, well, I, I don't know your particular circumstance. I could only talk about uh, uh, the diocese where I serve, and and uh, I I would say. You know, to especially if you were interested in in the uh, the Latin Mass, I think you 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 should write and and see where it might be available, or go on a website and 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 look it up and and see if you might be able to find uh, something that is reasonably within your area. Um, our our efforts to to continue to bring about uh, reverence uh, and. Uh, 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 Let's say conformity to to our uh, liturgical directives is 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 an important area to to do, and it's one of the 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 uh, the areas I think that when when Saint John Paul II gave the Roman Missal back in 2000, it's now 15 years old, and then when the new translation of it occurred about four years ago, these were all efforts uh, being made uh, to be able to to deepen uh, the reverence. Uh, of the celebration of the Holy Eucharist. We want participation. We want that participation uh, to to be active and conscious, as as the Vatican Council II says, but we want it, of course, to be very reverent. So um, uh, I I encourage you not to give up on this, but uh, I don't know if I can give you any more of an answer than I've given you right now, Marianne. Thank you, Archbishop. And Marianne, I might suggest that if you do an Internet search about the... uh the Mass of 1963. There are a lot of uh, groups and organizations around the country that have really uh, fostered the celebration of this Mass after the uh, the motu proprio set forth by Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. And I think maybe if you contact some of those groups, they may have some good charitable strategies for uh, yeah. That's a good idea. That that's a good idea, Jack. That's a good idea. Yeah, Una Voce America would really be a good uh, a good Google search for you. Marianne, we appreciate that uh, phone call today. Next up for us is Rich in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He's listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Rich, you're on with Archbishop Joseph Kurtz. Hi, Rich. 
Are you there, Rich? Well, yes, I am. Hello, Archbishop. Hi, Rich. Nice to talk with you. Likewise. Two quick questions. Rich, I came from the other part of the state. I was from the northeast part of Pennsylvania, so I know Pennsylvania a little bit. Great, great. Um, Well, listen, uh, two things about the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops that I just wanted to ask. One was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, another positive you maybe could have added to your list that you mentioned at the beginning of the show. And another is a question about a concern relating to government. Um, mm-hmm. First, a positive is, I believe, um, the community aspect that, that that is offered when when you the bishops, the men meet and and they're able to talk and discuss problems in a you know kind of a safe environment and uh, and reinforce and support each other. And I, I'd love to hear you talk to that for a moment. Oh, it's a, it's a, I will. Thank you. And you said you also have a. Did you want to mention the concern, and then I could do both, or do one of Sure, yes. So the concern, and, and it's really, maybe it's nothing, maybe it's just in my head, but, uh, you know, when I run organizations, it's important to understand, you know, governance and organizational behavior. And so one of the, one of the aspects of the bishops meeting like this and uh, forming committees is that it could end up... Um, somehow in, infringing on the independence of individual bishops to you know to be the ordinaries in their in their mm-hmm. churches wherever they are in the country uh, and so there's a pro and a con there and I just wonder how you men balance that and you particularly as the leader these days of the US conference how you balance that to make sure you're not forcing you know a position on a fellow bishop that that may be in good conscience. He, he does oh, boy, they're good. They're, they're two excellent questions and, and, and topics, Rich. I'll be happy to let me say a word about each and then uh, see if this answers it. First of all, uh, I am so glad you mentioned community, or I think in, in the Latin word, which is often used, is communio. And uh, when we had the Synod of Bishops in Rome with Pope Francis, uh, one of the things he said at the beginning of the Synod. Uh, He said, this is not a parliament, we're not here to pass laws, but we're here to be in communion. And you are absolutely right in saying that uh, one of the reasons I think bishops look forward to the two meetings we have each year is precisely for the opportunity to come together to celebrate the Holy Eucharist each day. Uh, You know that we end each meeting with a holy hour at which which one of our bishops gives... uh, a reflection. In this case, it was uh, the retired bishop of Spokane, Bishop William Skillstad, a former uh, president of the Bishops' Conference. And, and then we have the opportunity to receive the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And I often feel that the, the greatest closeness at those meetings is not necessarily in the business meeting, but often in that last hour in which we uh, adore our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament and have an opportunity for ourselves to go to confession. Um, The question you mentioned about a governance, by the way, is also a very, very good one. Now, understand that uh, the the Bishops' Conference, with a few exceptions, but the work that the Bishops' Conference does is advisory in terms of the pastoral responsibility in a local diocese. So that uh, maybe I can use that example of of the uh, formal... Uh, document uh, the formal statement on on the, the dangers of pornography, or uh, we've we've done some other another statement. I did a presidential statement on the realities of religious persecution. Well, there was great great support among the bishops. I mean, a high support, almost a hundred percent. So these were not things that were very debated. But but when all is said and done, when that bishop goes back into his particular diocese. He knows that diocese better than anybody, and and he works with his people, and that document becomes a resource for him. So he is not required to use that document, but it is a resource for him. There are certain uh, times in which there's particular law of the Church, and it's very rare, but there are times in which uh, uh, the Holy Father will, will designate that a particular uh, direction will be reserved not just to the local bishop, but rather to uh, to a region or to the episcopal conferences. That happened, for example, a number of years ago when there was determination of 
which would be holy days of obligation and which would be not. That's a little controversial because some places uh, like the direction and some don't. But it was an example in which um, in which provinces needed to work together. Uh, the idea was that it would otherwise confuse people. Uh, but in general, I think you, you would be pleased to know that the local bishop sees um, all the, the things that are passed, the, the various statements and directions, as really an, a help to him. Now, I will say this, that uh, there is a strong encouragement for us to maintain unity, and I think that's a good thing. It's a good thing for us within the United States to seek unity, and that's why we have free discussions and we have votes, and uh, etc., but uh, but I think there's pretty good clarity on that. Did you have something in the back of your mind, Rich, on a particular issue that you thought uh, was a problem with governance, or were you thinking more generally? Yes, more generally. Actually, you answered, okay. uh, you answered my good. concern, so thank you. Good. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate the phone call. In the last couple minutes we have here, we're going to go to Chris, who is in a faraway land called Louisville, Kentucky, listening oh, on AM 1040. Chris, you're on with your Archbishop. Hello, Archbishop Kurt. Hey, Chris. It's nice to talk with you. It's good. It's good to know that there's someone else uh, uh, on the phone uh, in Louisville. Yeah. Uh, my question concerns uh, some accusations by people that follow the King James Bible that there are missing verses out of the Catholic version. Yes. You, did you Did you hear earlier my conversation or no? Yeah, about the uh, translation? Yes. Yes, I did. Yeah. My my understanding, I'm not I'm not a, a, an expert on this, Chris, but my understanding is that the King James version would not have certain books of the Bible. For instance, I'm not sure and I maybe I I hope I I'm, I'm correct on this. I don't believe for instance the book of Maccabees that we're just in fact are are now being uh, were just recently part of our morning mass. Maybe you you recall if you've gone to, to morning mass, uh, the first reading has been from the book of Maccabees, and uh, I don't believe that that book is in uh, the uh, the Bible, uh, is in the King James version of the Bible. Likewise, I do not believe that the letter to James in the New Testament is included in, and it had to do with uh, disputes that. Uh, that some of it, that some of the Protestant churches had on what they considered uh, authentic parts of the Bible. Now, remember, our as Catholics, uh, our understanding of what's what's in or not in the Bible, what we call the canon of the Bible, uh, that uh, goes back and was set around the third century A.D. So there were 